Good morning, everybody. I'm Laura Bloomberg. Um, we're going to get started with the panel right away, but I just want to make just a, a couple of comments. First of all, I have to tell you it's an honor to join this illustrious group of sponsors in supporting this really important conference um, on a really important topic. And Dr. Kleiner talked about why it matters, and I think you're all here because you think it matters. I just want to share with you a perspective from a, a policy and public affairs school that when we graduate a couple hundred students every year, many of them are going to go into very specific focus areas and study very specific things, but many more of them are going to be generalists and they're going to work on the Hill. They're going to staff congressional offices. They're going to staff legislative offices. And when they know and have a deep understanding of key policy issues like this, um, it, it changes the way decisions get made. And so I'm, I'm very, very grateful to be able to support the work of Morris Kleiner and all of our other colleagues who are here today in doing this, especially because of the unique or the important perspective on looking at this uh, across some boundaries, across time, across continents, um, and between research and policy and practice, which seems so important to me. So we um, uh, are down one panelist. Unfortunately, Beth Redbird was unable to be here. Uh, so we just had a quick um, putting our heads together, 30 seconds from here, and decided we would each take a little bit more time. So I think each of the panelists will take about 12 minutes to share their take on this question, this theme of licensing over time. We will go in the order of the um, uh, speakers as they appear on your agenda, Dick Carpenter, then Darwin Deo, then Corey Everett. Morris has already told us a bit about who they are and where they're from, so in the interest of time, I won't repeat that. We had a conference planning call. This is always something that's sort of important to me when we talk about practitioners and, um, and scholars together. It's this question of naming. Who do we call doctor? Who do we call president? Who do we call something else? And we all agreed that not to be informal, but to be egalitarian, we will go by first names. So I just want you to know when we use first names, we did have that conversation. Uh, so some of our speakers, do all of our speakers have slides? I do. A few of our speakers have slides. When we're done, we will obviously take questions. If there are a lot of questions from the audience, I think we'll take two or three at a time. Um, so that we can hear what you're thinking about and then invite all of the panelists to respond. Otherwise, we'll take one question at a time if that seems to work better. So we will start with um, Dick Carpenter and then turn to Darwin. So over to you, Dick. All right. Good morning. Uh, late last year, my co-authors and I at the Institute for Justice released the second edition of our study, License to Work. <clears throat> the first edition was released in 2012, and I should acknowledge one of my co-authors on the first edition Angela Erickson, who's back there in the back <clears throat> with future economist Cyrus, um, seven-week-old Cyrus. Uh, so the, the second edition came out in November of, of last year. And like the first edition, we examined licensing requirements in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. So I'm going to briefly address just the primary findings from the 2017 study, and then also talk about some new findings that were not in that study that are going to uh, be coming out in, a, in an article here next month examining changes over time between the 2012 and the 2017 uh, data. So in our research, we examined the licensing requirements of 102 low to moderate income occupations, again, in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. And these are occupations that are ideal for people who are entering or re-entering the economy. And these are also occupations where we see a lot of dynamic entrepreneurship. The requirements that we gathered uh, were many, but there were five in particular that were most consistent across all the occupations and the states. And those were education and experience, uh, minimum grade, minimum age, number of exams that must be completed, and then fees. Typically fees paid to the state, but sometimes fees are paid to other organizations at the prompting of the state. So on average, these 102 occupations or licenses require aspiring workers to spend about a year in education or training. They have to pay a little more than $260 in fees, and they have to complete at least one examination. So beginning with the results for uh, the occupations, uh, the uh, occupations, again, we looked at 102 of them. There were 10 of those 102 that are licensed in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. And they included things like barber, cosmetologist, 
truck and bus driver, and water well driller. There were six occupations that were licensed in only one state, and those included things like florist, uh, in, licensed in Louisiana, psychiatric aid, and social and human services assistant. The occupation with the greatest licensing burden is interior designer, as it was in 2012. If one wants to work as an interior designer in the states that license it, you are required to complete six years of education and experience. You have to pay more than $1,000 in fees on average, and you'll have to complete at least one costly examination. The occupation with the lightest burden uh, was packer. If you want to work as a packer in states that license it, you will pay just on average about $33. Turning to state results, these requirements that I mentioned, we combined those into a score um, that enabled us to determine which states had the severest burdens for licensing, which states had the lightest burdens for licensing. So we first looked at how many of the occupations these states license. That's the first thing we looked at. None of the states license all 102, um, but we did find that 28 of the states license more than half of the occupations in our list of 102. The states that licensed the most were Louisiana and Washington. Washington State, that is. These states license 77 of the 102 that we studied. The state that licenses the fewest was Wyoming, licensing 26 on average across all the states. The states license 54 of the 102 that we studied. As for how burdensome the licensing requirements are on average in the states, we discovered that Hawaii, on average, has the greatest licensing burdens. And it did so in our 2012 study as well. Nebraska was at the bottom of having, as having the lightest burdens. And our scoring system also enabled us to combine the number of occupations licensed with how burdensome those licensing laws are. We combined those into a single score. We ranked all the states. And California turned out to be the state that licenses very broadly and onerously. And it is followed by Nevada, Arkansas, Arizona, and Hawaii. The state at the bottom of that list was Wyoming, followed by Vermont, Montana, South Dakota, and Colorado. Perhaps the most striking findings of our report are how inconsistent the licensing requirements are across states. And I'll mention just three types of inconsistencies. The first is the vast majority of the jobs that we studied are unlicensed in at least one state and often in most states. So let me give just a few examples. I mentioned interior designer earlier. Interior designers are licensed in three states and the District of Columbia. Tree trimmers are licensed in seven states. Furniture upholsterers are licensed in 10 states. And auctioneers are licensed in 30 states. A second type of inconsistency is that licensing requirements vary greatly from one state to another to do the exact same job. So one of those that I just mentioned, auctioneer. If you want to work as an auctioneer in the states that license it, four of those states require that you must complete at least a year of education and training. But in Vermont, it is nine days. Louisiana requires only seven days. In other states, there are no education and training requirements at all to work as an auctioneer. But auctioneer is not an idiosyncratic license. So I have a few slides to look at some other examples. So if we go to the next slide, <clears throat> this is or should be locksmith. So locksmiths are licensed in 14 states. So you can see that in most states, the education and training requirements are at or near zero, except for in New Jersey, where one must complete more than 700 days of education and training in order to work as a locksmith. Let's go to the next slide. This is crane operator, licensed in 18 states. Again, many of these have no education and training requirements at all to work as a crane operator, except uh, for other states that require more than 700. And then in New York, it's more than 1,000 days of education and training. The next slide is unarmed security guard, which is licensed in 34 states. Most of the states, again, have almost no education and training requirements, except, strangely, North Dakota, which requires more than 200 days of education and training. And then finally, manicurist, 
So a manicurist is licensed in almost all the states, except Connecticut. Connecticut does not license manicurists. But others, all the other states in DC do, and you can see that the training requirements are uh, very disparate across the states. So these are just several examples of how uh, the licensing requirements to do the exact same job are very different. A third type of inconsistency is evident when we compare the licensing requirements of one occupation versus another vis-a-vis -vis the safety risks associated with those jobs. So a classic example is comparing cosmetologists to emergency medical technician. We found in our 2012 study that it takes 12 times the amount of training to become a cosmetologist as it does to become an emergency medical technician. People who literally hold lives of other people in their hands. But that is not unusual. It turns out that 73 other occupations have greater licensing burdens on average than do emergency medical technicians. So those were the results, top line results from our 2017 study. In the forthcoming article that I mentioned, we compared the 2012 to 2017 results, and we were particularly interested in examining changes um, in these requirements. Did they grow over time, or did they decrease over time? As Dr. Kleiner mentioned, uh, we've had much greater attention paid to licensing in the past probably eight years, and so it, with uh, efforts across the states to institute reform, did we see changes significantly over time? So that's what we were examining. So if we jump ahead two slides, I think you'll get an idea. In this table, you'll see what we saw from 2012 to 2017. The licensing requirement with the greatest change, and it was a positive change, that is it grew over time, was in fees. So on average, fees grew about 14% from 2012 to 2017. And this is after adjusting for inflation. After that, we see that minimum grade and minimum age requirements also increased over time, more than a little more than 11%, and then exams also increased. The number of exams increased over time, about 1%. The licensing requirement that did not increase was education and training. That actually saw a small decrease, although that small decrease was not significant over time. So, the states also saw some increases or decreases. Um, going back, sorry, going back to occupations for a moment, the occupation with the greatest positive difference, that is, it changes over time, was psychiatric aid. So the, the requirements for psychiatric aids have increased significantly over time. Uh, some other ones included interior designer and dental assistant. 16 other occupations also saw increases over time. The remainder saw small decreases. Home entertainment installer actually saw the most significant decrease over time. States also saw increases or decreases. Alaska and Hawaii, their requirements increased from 2012 to 2017. Uh, they had uh, 19 other states um, with them in seeing uh, increases over time. And the remaining states saw decreases led by Arizona, Louisiana, and Texas. So the licensing burdens are greater in 2017 compared to 2012 on average. Uh, and the greatest growth was amongst fees. So as for implications, our results called into question either the need for license, some of these licenses altogether or the significant requirements associated with these licenses. More specifically, when we look at the significant differences or disparities, it suggests that many of these licenses very likely uh, have little to no relationship to public health and safety or the requirements appear to have little to no relationship to public health and safety. So consequently, in the report, we discuss various types of reform, ranging from eliminating some licenses altogether to significantly reducing some of the licensing requirements or replacing some of the licenses with less restrictive options. And we have some other reform um, ideas in there as well, and I won't get into those for the sake of time. But as our 2012 to 2017 results indicate, uh, licensing is still going in the direction of more licenses and still going in the direction of increased licensing requirements as well. Reform has been slow in recent years. There has been reform, and some, in some states, significant reform, but reform has been slow. Um, the reform that has taken place, we tend to see, occurs either in the legislature or in the courts 
as well. The Institute for Justice is a nonprofit public interest law firm. This is one of our signature issues, and we have been very active in the courts since 1991 in uh, litigating on behalf of individuals who are unable to work in the occupation of their choice because of unnecessary licensing. In 2015, this Texas Supreme Court, um, in, the, in the Patel decision, struck down the licensing requirement for eyebrow threaders. In that decision, not only did they strike down that licensing requirement, but they also made some very sweeping uh, holdings. And so this, I think, is one of the most significant portions from their findings. I'm quoting, as today's case shows, the Texas occupational licensure regime, predominantly impeding Texas of mo Texans of modest means, can seem a hodgepodge of disjointed, logic-defying irrationalities where the burdens imposed seem almost farcical, forcing many lower income Texans to face a choice, submit to a logical bureaucracy or operate an illegal business. Licensure absurdities become apparent when you compare the wildly disparate education experience burdens visited on various professions. The disconnect between the strictness of some licensing rules and their alleged public welfare rationale is patently bizarre. So that decision from Patel is now being used in Texas to, uh, to initiate significant reforms um, in licensing very broadly and not just in eyebrow threaders. So with that, I'm gonna stop and I'll turn it over to Dr. Deo and I'll be happy to address questions later. Thanks, David. Thank you. All right, so thank you very much. Um, thank you to Morris for inviting me uh, to speak here. Really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this. When I started working on licensing, I was starting my dissertation and I was told Nobody's going to care about this. This has been done. The research on this has been exhausted. You should find something else to do. So I was very happy to tell everyone it's not done. We're still very much engaged in this. So uh, moving on with this, we're talking about quality as a shorthand for public health and safety. Licensing is often upheld in courts under the rationale that it protects public health and safety. This is something we can uh, empirically evaluate. We can look and see. Um, this has actually been a little bit more difficult to do historically because data on quality has been hard to come by. Wages, earnings, employment, these are all included in many different government issued reports going back to, I think the wages first showed up in 1945. So that's, it. that's a great starting point. But to evaluate quality, we have to do a couple different challenges. One is that public health and safety is not necessarily something that applies to all occupations. For nurse practitioners, this seems to make a lot of obvious sense. To opticians or interior designers or even manicurists, this is not as obvious. So how do we measure quality and public health and safety for that? And it's also not as obvious how we actually measure public health and safety when we look at outcomes. This is an issue that shows up in health economics research a lot of the time. You often end up looking at things like mortality and readmissions. But it's very hard to identify a causal effect when you're looking at some change in policy and say public health and safety or even other um, health outcomes. So moving from there, I'm gonna do a little background on the presentation of uh, licensing in terms of the costs and benefits and move forward with some questions we can evaluate on quality from there. So much of the literature on licensing does suggest there are monopoly market effects. Uh, it raises barriers to entry even at the margin. It raises costs, which may be burdensome to providers. It may deter people who may be low quality providers. Um, so the effects of that can be ambiguous. But we do see things like higher consumer prices. Um, especially for things like manicurists and cosmetologists. I always like to compare the prices for cosmetologists versus barbers, um, but they're all licensed. So we do see a relative increase. We also see lower mobility. Licensing creates barriers not just within a state in terms of whether or not somebody can enter an occupation in that state, but also across states. Some states actually have compacts with each other which basically observe that you were licensed in another state and therefore readmit you, but this is not universal. Uh, the employment effects, 
are a little bit more ambiguous, but we do find sufficient evidence that there are negative employment effects from licensing. This is all well and good, but if it's actually protecting public health and safety, in terms of consumer welfare, it may be a net social gain. So let's think about it, right? We actually see this showing up in court cases, as I mentioned, going all the way back to 1889. This is uh, the first case uh, that made it to the Supreme Court on physician licensing. And then we have more recent cases here. We could think about licensing creating a higher quality because it actually cuts out the bottom of the distribution. All low quality providers are prevented from entering the market, in theory. But because it creates barriers to entry, this is not voluntary certification, we might also be concerned about the consumer welfare effects, anti-competitive effects that lead to basically lower quality. So this is some uh, evidence from the first Supreme Court case. Justice Field was saying it's OK for a government to regulate occupations because we're protecting people from the consequences of ignorance and incapacity as well as of deception and fraud. Basically, you want to protect people who don't any, know any better Maybe it's really hard to figure out if your doctor is good or not without some sort of signal. But we can evaluate these things in the modern context, moving beyond just how physicians were being distinguished from barbers at the turn of the 20th century to some issues that are more uh, relevant to ourselves today, such as, as Dick mentioned, why is there so much variation in licensing? This is not just in the... Um, number of where states, um, occup where occupations are licensed, but also how much. Why is grandfathering allowed? It's a major issue if we're thinking about quality or public health and safety. And then does it actually raise quality? This is an empirical question we can test, okay? We have to identify it very carefully, but it's testable. So I'll go through these three things um, in a little bit more detail um, and then Propose some evidence. So official US estimates right now uh, put the number of occupations licensed in the United States at about 1,100 occupations, regulated to some degree. Requirements vary by state. And of course, not all occupations are licensed in every state or to the same degree. I like to show barbers are licensed in all states. Opticians are licensed in 22. And florists are licensed in one state. This begs the question, if it's only licensed in one state, why is it licensed? How is this a public health and safety issue? Um, especially when we learn how florists are actually licensed. We might start to ask some questions. Um, there's also the variation in the degree of licensing. So there's education and training requirements, and board exams, fees, other things as well. But when we think about, um, when we look at the minimum grade, we're thinking you have to have at least usually a high school education. That might include most people that we think about, but certainly not everyone, especially if you come from a background where you weren't able to complete high school or you can't prove that you have a high school degree. Are you now excluded from this uh, occupation? And I also like to mention with opticians because there was a major uh, Supreme Court case related to the licensing of opticians, opticians are no longer licensed in that state. But the Supreme Court said, sure, you can license it. So again, thinking about this, why are there changes? Why would you unlicense an occupation if it's all about public health and safety? Related to this is grandfathering. If this is about public health and safety, I have a lot of major questions. Um, we like to, in uh, Law and Econ, we like to think about playing by the rules of the game. Who's playing by the rules of the game? What are the rules of the game? Grandfathering essentially lets diff different players in the same game play by different rules. Now, this might have distributional impacts on the gains that different providers face because they entered at a later uh, period in the market. But from a public health and safety standpoint, this should concern us. <laughs> If licensing requirements are about protecting public health and safety, and if they actually do impact um, quality, then we should be concerned that everybody's not playing by the same rules. The 
Great example that Morris has brought up is the minimum wage, right? Everyone has to abide by the new minimum wage. You don't get to say, I was here first, I get to continue paying the minimum wage that was in place in 1980. And it's now 2018 and everybody else has to abide by the new minimum wage. No, everybody plays by the same rules. Well, here we're playing by different rules, which makes me a little worried. <laughs> Either people are uh, maybe doing too much licensing and it's not about public health and safety, or they're not licensed and actually not protecting public health and safety. I have a lot of questions about EMTs and why they face less licensing than cosmetologists if this is about public health and safety. All right, then we get to actually having to measure quality. It might seem easy to measure quality in the sense that saying if something is good or bad, safe or not, you didn't send somebody to the hospital after you cut their hair. Um, that seems like it might be binary. I use ex this example not facetiously. When I was in college, my licensed cosmetologist was later sent to prison for a multiple homicide. So um, being licensed did not prevent her from becoming a murderer, which makes me feel really great about all the times she had scissors next to my head. But, right, this is not obvious. It's a real life example, I can't make this up. Um, we wanna think about how we're measuring quality. I, in my research, measure quality for service providers using Yelp ratings. There's Uber ratings, which are also um, a great new topic for discussion. There's a lot of ratings that we use in health economics to evaluate providers and whether or not they are having too many readmissions or if their patients are all dying. Um, a real problem in hospitals. Um, if you are not meeting a certain threshold, right, which you want a maximum, you don't want to be over that threshold, um, you're in trouble. Well, somebody has to set these quality metrics, right? It's subjective, and they often are updated. So again, this is a moving target problem. Um, we also should not be assuming licensing has a linear relationship with quality across occupations. Licensing may be able to influence quality in one direction for a occupation, but that might not give us any insight into how it would impact another occupation. In fact, that might just be something specific to that occupation. Um, then there's the stated defenses for licensing often don't actually match up with what's going on. So florists. The florist case, there it is. Okay, I don't know where the pointer is, but florist licensing, Meadows v. Odom. A witness in this case insisted that florists in Louisiana had to be licensed because of the concerns with infectious dirt. This is a real, like, a real thing that was said. And this could make sense, right? We wanna protect people from all the dirt and maybe like dangerous things in the dirt, except the licensing board exams did not measure or account for infectious dirt in any way. Okay, it was an aesthetic test. Your floral bouquets were being judged by a panel of florists on the licensing board. So is this actually measuring up? Is it actually targeting what it wants to target or it says it wants to target? I've already mentioned there's limited historical data but we're starting to address this problem and I'll talk about that more in a moment. But lastly, I always like to remind people of behavioral change. People respond to incentives. People respond to the rules of the game they're playing in. So quality can also be very sensitive to provider expectations about the metrics that they're facing, whether or not they're being measured on it at all, and the initial equilibrium. So I have research uh, with my co-author on provider hospital ratings, um, and we find some pretty weird things. Um, not what you would expect, especially when you start splitting um, hospitals into different buckets based on how much they were doing before the metric was introduced. Okay? So we actually have talked about a lot of problems with quality, but there's been significant research on this subject as well. A lot in the last 10 years.
But one of the first um, was Carolyn Gaston, who came up with the term the Cadillac effect, where they were looking at electrical fires and electrician licensing. And essentially what happened was with the electrical electrician licensing, the cost of hiring an electrician rose so much that people decided to fix their own electrical problems themselves. That did not go so well. So instead of having quality managed in the market itself and you're, everybody's regulated, it's very hard to say, well, you know, you've got, you know, some wiring at home and we can't really regulate pliers. We can't really stop you from trying to change that, like mess around in your own house. We get these problems. We find some neutral outcomes, but we also find negative outcomes. I find negative outcomes with my Yelp research on service provider quality. Having licensing at all drops the Yelp star by about a quarter rating. Um, and then we get some interesting distributional changes. So childcare licensing and teacher licensing seem to actually increase quality in terms of um, the child care or the teacher uh, student tests. But it's concentrated in high income areas. These gains accrue to high income neighborhoods and the losers are people in low income neighborhoods. That might be something we are concerned about. And then we got to think about how we're actually producing quality. So there's some evidence from a deposition on how much time is actually spent training people to stand correctly at a barber uh, school. The owner is not sure. Um, we might think about the requirements actually generating barriers to entry in the training market. And also not omit the fact that firms already have an incentive to invest in human capital of their employees. So I'd like to wrap it up there. Um, and thank you again. Thank you, Morris, for putting this together. Thank you for inviting us. I'm Corey Everett, and with the Council on Licensure, Enforcement, and Regulation, CLEAR. Um, we are an international resource for professional regulation. Um, we promote regulatory excellence by hosting a forum, basically. We do that through symposia, trainings, um, conferences, and, and that sort. Um, I do want to just um, start off with we are, we are not a policy-making body, and so we don't lobby for a particular position or another. Um, we're really intended to create an area for regulators to come together and really talk about best practice, essentially. Um, so has anyone heard of right touch regulation in the room? I'm getting some nods, a couple of you, yeah. So this is a really big theme within, um, within regulation. So what I want to just talk about today, I think we heard a lot, I think, um, already about licensing over time, how it's grown, how it's changed. And I want to talk a little bit today about what the regulators um, and the regulatory community is currently looking at and how they're innovating. So with right touch regulation, we're really looking for that sweet spot, um, right? So doing the most we can to protect the consumer with minimal interference into the marketplace. Um, so I, I, it's basically about understanding the problem before jumping in with the solution. I do wanna distinguish the regulator's role often being you know, a, a bureaucrat, a state employee, a government employee versus a legislature or a legislator who is you know, passing some of these policies. So there are, there are limits to what a regulator essentially can accomplish. Um, so, so right touch regulation really does look at agility. It looks at um, the regulatory um, requirements acknowledging that they need to change over time. That what was set up uh, 20, 30, 40, or 100 years ago may not uh, sufficiently address the consumer harm being done today. Um, and that consumer harm that did occur 100 years ago may not be a concern now. Um, and so that regulatory scheme needs to shift. Um, so we recently kind of polled our community and asked them, you know, what is the biggest regulatory challenge that you're dealing with today? Um, the number one response was deregulation of professions that they thought shouldn't be regulated. Um, along with that was regulatory reform. So just trying to decrease the red tape um, that it takes to get into a profession. So finding additional pathways into a profession, reducing uh, some of the educational barriers, um, allowing for experience, um, those types of things to qualify for a license and demonstrate competence. Um, a lot of folks mentioned that they were mitigating turf wars. 
um, and I know we're going to address this um, later today, those scopes of practice, right, where there's a scope that overlaps and multiple professions can, um, can perform the same task. Prescribing is a great um, example of that. Nurses can prescribe, doctors can prescribe, um, you know, psychologists can prescribe a, a number of different professions. Um, what we see with the turf wars is, is again, that kind of anti-competitive conduct where they're saying, no, we're the only ones that have the skill and education necessary to do this, and we're going to take this to the legislature to prevent you from doing it. Um, and then I guess the last one was um, just a request or, or difficulty in identifying, describing, and quantifying the risk um, and the public harm. And I think that's, you know, as, as we look at this, consor um, this symposium today, looking at how research can help policy, this is actually one that um, our community is specifically, ch uh, you know, challenged with. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Um, but I do want to talk about, a uh, you know, just how regulators are innovating a little bit today. Um, so, and, and just changing the occupational field. Um, the, I'm going to talk a little bit about upstream risk analysis, harm reduction, and evidence-based um, sanctions. So upstream risk, um, this is um, just a proactive approach to regulation. Um, it's basically looking at a very early and specific intervention to either decrease the likelihood of a negative outcome or increase the likelihood of a successful or positive outcome. Uh, so it's identifying, it's understanding and addressing potential problems or barriers to that outcome. Uh, with that, it's a problem-solving approach, and so it really uh, emphasizes, you know, influence versus enforcing, which is a bit of a different role for the regulator as we think about consumer protection. Um, so a, a couple examples of upstream risk, the Professional Standards Authority uh, in the UK took on a cross-profession analysis um, of basically two, two risks they saw uh, in the marketplace. One was sexual misconduct, and another was dishonesty. Um, and then they mapped the predictive factors of those behaviors. And they looked at um, different systems levels. So they looked at the, individu the individual level as well as the social or organizational dimensions that, um, in which those violations occurred. Um, they looked at demographics, finding you know, that men were much more likely uh, to, to engage in sexual misconduct, especially as physicians. Um, although that did drop with some of the other professions, especially with allied healthcare, there was a much more equal footing um, on, on gender. Uh, they also identified associated or gateway violations. Um, so what they looked at with, um, with sexual misconduct was the boundary violations that just led up to the sexual misconduct and could have predicted that had we addressed the boundary violations first. Um, they also took a look at the working environments. They found that those um, violations happened in more autonomous and fluid working environments than the highly structured and controlled environments. Um, and then other behaviors that popped up, like, you know, we would all suspect these, right? Grooming your, your victim or finding a very vulnerable victim. Uh, and then lastly, uh, they identified that the culture and the environment was very important, that sometimes, that, that often sexual misconduct was occurring um, in cultures that were, were permissive of sexual innuendos, um, which isn't surprising, right? We can see how this would deteriorate. Um, and then often that it included cross-cultural um, environments where some of that type of communication um, was not clearly understood and therefore was permitted. Um, basically, I, I didn't, you know, I don't come from this culture. I didn't um, know that that would be inappropriate. I assumed the best, even though I felt uncomfortable. Um, so that's a, it's an example of upstream risk analysis. Another one is harm reduction. This is identifying and understanding where feasible um, um, the problems that are presented um, and that are harming the patients, and then looking at how to craft a response to that. So instead of like anticipating um, you know, what's coming upstream, right, we're looking at where is the current harm. Um, so this also happens at an individual system, um, an individual a systems and a regulator level. And a great example of this um, is the General Medical Council in the UK. Um, so they're kind of taking this approach. They're looking specifically at communication failures. I think this one is really interesting, um, especially as we see more team environments in healthcare. Um, what occupational licensing has traditionally done is look at a at only the individual, right, to say you either. 
you either meet the standard of care or you don't meet the standard of care. It's very binary. And what we see in those team environments is communication breaks down and leads to harm. So that could be communication between the physician and the patient, could be communication among the team, right? Um, it could be communication um, with the, you know, other colleagues, all of those, um, or, or just a failure to listen, right? Um, and so, so that I think is really interesting, and I do think that's where we're seeing some of the consumer harm that help that that is occurring, um, up to you know wrong site surgeries, which is hopefully never happening, but it does happen, right? Um, and so, how do we control to that, and how does the regulatory um, scheme respond to that? And I don't know that we have all the tools we need in our tool belt to to do that, but there are some tools that maybe are a little archaic we could we could let go of. Um, so this is looking at some common violations, um, especially preventable harm. Um, some of those are, you know, prescribing errors and those types of things. Um, and then the Australian Health um, Practitioner Regulatory Agency, uh, they're also taking on this approach. I think it, it's going to be an area we're watching very closely. They've partnered with the University of Melbourne. Basically, they're going to be data mining their entire regulatory set and looking at where harm is occurring and then working back with the boards to decide you know, what is the appropriate response? How can we prevent this? Uh, and then lastly, um, evidence-based sanctions. So uh, this is just evaluating the effectiveness of those disciplinary interventions to control risk, uh, to protect the consumer, all of those. So, you know, we know licensing uh, is a gateway, right? We're regulating a gateway and who can enter the practice and who cannot. But then you also have disciplinary actions. Um, and so when a practitioner fails to meet the standard of care or comply with the rules, um, they could be disciplined. Um, and this could take a number of different effects. It could be all of a slap on a wrist and, you know, a warning um, up to a, a particular restriction on the license um, and up to uh, removing the license, right, and saying you can no longer practice in this profession. Uh, so one of the things we've seen, especially for egregious um, uh, violations such as sexual misconduct, is the use of chaperones. Um, and so we have folks like Ron Patterson that are looking into this and saying, well, are, are chaperones the most effective disciplinary control um, to address the sexual misconduct? Um, and is the chaperone specifically for the practitioner or is that for the patient? Um, because you're looking at very, your, your attention is divided, right? Um, and so, so what should that look like? Um, Others are looking at whether um, continuing education is sufficient to remediate ethical violations, um, which I would say are, are rather um, substantial, as well as boundary violations. Um, and then how does the, the regulator address the systems level risk of misconduct? Um, so basically the system itself can protect the bad apples because they're not transparent. Um, we see this with some of um, the most egregious cases here in the United States. I worked on a few um, in Colorado. Uh, so one example, Rocky Allen was um, the uh, uh, a surgical assistant um, that basically was uh, also addicted to drugs and so was um, using and reusing syringes um, to get high and then using the syringes on patients, refilling them with saline solution and putting them back in the surgical room. What had happened there was a systems failure. Every single employer basically didn't want to say why they had fired him, and so it never came up, and he was allowed to simply lie, right, on his applications to, for new employment and also new licenses. And so because the system didn't want to talk about it or share their data um, or be transparent with the consumer, um, several folks were exposed to HIV and hepatitis C and lots of other bad things. Um, so that's just... Uh, another example. Um, so that's all I have for you guys today, just a little bit about what's going on in the regulatory sphere, but definitely happy to address any of your questions. Thank you. Thanks, all of three of you, for your helpful comments. And you, I think you, you've all done, in your own ways, um, a, an effective job of helping us see where we've come in a lot of different um, uh, in a lot of different directions over time. I'd like to open it up for questions, although I'd like to exercise my prerogative to ask the first one. Um, and this is actually asking Dick to uh, comment on something you said and then both of you to respond. I, Dick, I think I heard you say something about looking forward now 
perhaps we can be thinking about less restrictive options. And when you said less restrictive options, I thought about that as I listened to Darwin say, well, why are we doing this in the first place? Is this all about health and safety? So partly I'm thinking, what are those less restrictive options? And what do we mean by option? Option for what? And I heard Corey talk about harm reduction, but also agility. So I'm thinking about those things, your respective lenses on, Dick, what you might say about um, uh, less restrictive options going forward. So for many years, we've all lived in the binary world of licensing and no licensing. So when we think, do we need to have government intervention? Well, okay, it's a, it's a yes or no. And if we say yes, then immediately we go to licensing. But there are many, it turns out there are many options of government uh, involvement that are not strictly licensing. So in the report, we actually address many of these different options. And we, picture, we, uh, we put it in the form of a, an inverted pyramid where the, the, the bottom of the pyramid is the license and at the top, the broadest part, would be uh, no government intervention at all, i.e. market regulation. So just so we're all clear, we, we understand that the market is regulating even though the government is not regulating. So that, of course, it would be an option of regulation without government intervention. But if the government is involved, there are options that are not as restrictive as licensing but may come with some of the same benefits. So for instance, mandatory bonding and or insurance. Um, deceptive trade practice acts, which many states, or I would probably say all the states already have. Uh, registration, certification. These are all different types of government intervention that do not have the same restrictive nature of licensing, but can have some of the same benefits. So in the report, we talk about how uh, legislatures ought to examine, as Corey said, what are the identifiable or demonstrable needs? What are the empirically based needs threats, i.e. threats to public health and safety that need to be addressed, and what is the appropriate level of government intervention, if government intervention is necessary, to address those needs. Rather than immediately going to the very blunt instrument of licensing, there may be something that's less restrictive that can still address those needs without closing off entry into the occupation. Thank you. Let's switch it up and go to Corey next and then to you, Darwin. So Corey, I'm wondering if you have a reaction to that as you think about what you said regarding right touch regulation and upstream innovation. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I definitely think Dick touched on a lot of them. Um, the different levels of licensure obviously very important and where we can look at deceptive trade practices and title restrictions, that's better than full-blown licensure. Um, within rules, what we're often able to um, accomplish are um, allowing different pathways to licensure. Um, and so, you know, what. What we've seen, right, is those educational requirements can kind of tick up a little bit. So um, where you used to have to just have a bachelor's degree to become a physical therapist, now you need a PhD. That seems a little excessive, but, um, uh, but that's kind of the, the, the trend, right? And so looking at non-academic pathways, leveraging apprenticeships, um, experience, all of those. Also looking at exams. Um, so exams are a double-edged sword, right? They generate a lot of money, which is why I'm not surprised to see with the license to work research that fees and exams both increased um, because they're revenue generating. Um, so e exams are helpful because you, know, uh, you could essentially eliminate a lot of the um, training requirements. So if you pass the national exam, forget about your residency, forget about you know, different practice hours, um, other certifications, so long as you demonstrate you can pass the exam, you should be able to practice. That's a, actually could be a very low barrier to entry. Um, the, but uh, with the proliferation of exams, um, those exams can become very pricey. And whether there's only one option um, that a board will accept, um, then it can become very restrictive. Um, and so looking at different ways to demonstrate competency um, that don't rely on a single um, uh, vendor who has a monopoly on the market, um, I think are, create more accessibility to the profession. Thank you. Mm -hmm. that one. Sure. So I'd like to echo some of the things Dick mentioned, right? Thinking about registration as an alternative. Um, instead of thinking about uh, we have licensing or we have nothing, we can think about gradations. Um, one common al uh, proposed alternative to licensing is certification, um, which can be done privately, um, or it could also be done through a government agency. So you still go and get the signaling from the government agency that says, 
Yep, they signed, uh, they passed whatever the exams were, um, and they've basically gotten credentials backed up by us, um, but it's not the same barrier to entry. Um, you have plenty of private organizations which um, condition membership on ethical behavior, um, best practices, um, and even offer things like continuing education. So again, it's still voluntary, like the Society of Professional Journalists, right? Like you don't want to lose your card to that because suddenly there are questions. Um, but without ha not having it, you can still, um, you know, write. We have the protection for speech, so you can still write, but there's a signal that comes with it. So um, I think like instead of thinking about the binary, there's plenty of room for um, latitude here. Um, and just also thinking about if we are thinking within the current licensing system, what actually goes in to the licensing. So when I was looking at um, my study, uh, looking at barbers and cosmetologists and so forth, Virginia and Texas are a couple of states that actually publish the pass rates for their exams. And they have both practical and written components to the exams. The practical exams have very high pass rates, uh, depending on the year. But where you'd say, okay, these people, a large share of people are competent at the practical component of their job. There's a very low pass rate on the written component. Um, and if you don't pass both, you can't get the license. So figuring out what actually needs to be going into these things instead of creating more barriers to entry, um, I really do not know what the history of barbering has to do with cutting hair. Um, that's a real thing that's on an exam. So evaluating that I think is a, another good step forward. Can I just respond to, um, to provide a caution as well? I think as we look at deregulation and regulatory reform, um, ratcheting down some of the requirements to a lower level license like a certification or a, le a registration is helpful where it makes me cringe just a little bit as a regulator is where we see new legislative efforts that are kind of trying to get their do their foot in the door and they often do it through registration um, they'll say okay well the state needs to needs to do something here because someone had a bad experience and so they start with registration and then the next year we see it become certification and then the next year it has ce and higher education requirements, and then it's, you know, they've got a full-blown license and all these different sub-licenses that they supervise and can restrict competition with. So I'll just like, it, it Christmas trees fast. <laughs> and I would add yeah. to that, it is not an accident either. Yeah. So we yeah. uh, analyzed this exact trend with interior designers where we looked at the history of how interior designers have been licensed over time, and it was in fact intentional that the, the idea was to start with the titling law and then elevate the titling law into a full licensure. Um, and we've seen that in other occupations as well that we have written about in other, um, other places. So let's open it up for questions. Um, I, I don't see, okay, let's start over here, sir, and then we'll, we'll take them one at a time. Sure. Yeah, we're done here. Um, I'm trying to understand There's a lot of them, I can see how somebody might make a reasonable defense, but this seems like pure rent seeking that's just transparent. What's the legal problem with just winning that just like that? Why aren't you getting that done in all your spare time, Dick? That's the question. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not yeah. saying you guys are bad, but there's something, I don't, <laughs> there's something I don't understand about the law. <laughs> You IJ attorneys must be terrible attorneys if you can't win an interior design case. <laughs> I think that's what he was asking. I'm pretty it sure. Sounded like it to me. Uh, so interior design is a great example because we actually brought lawsuits in Florida on the interior design licensing law. <clears throat> so it's uh, the rational basis test is what it's called. So the rational basis test essentially is if someone, and I'll unpack that in a moment, if someone can... 
do you, can create some sort of rational reason why this licensing law ought to exist, then that's good enough, and the judge will uphold it. And I say someone because it doesn't even have to be the the state doesn't have to do that. Sometimes the judge we see in cases will actually make things up. And I, I mean, that sounds ridiculous for me to say, but it's really, that's really what it is. Uh, Darwin mentioned the, the Forrest case in Louisiana. That was our case. And uh, the individual did in fact say infected dirt in a deposition. Um, other things included somebody might, might be harmed by a pin and a corsage. These are, these are the only th types of things that have to be mentioned to be acceptable under the rational basis test. So this, either the government or sometimes the judge will come up with this, what sounds like a rational reason. And if, if, if that sounds rational enough to the judge, then the judge says, okay, then I'm gonna uphold it. Paired with a deference to the legislature. So we at IJ have something called the Center for Judicial Engagement, where we're trying to uh, prod judges into being more engaged. Judges, by the way, these are the same individuals who in the morning will hear a case, a criminal case, and will weigh evidence in that criminal case, or a free speech case, and will weigh evidence in the free speech case to come to a decision. And then in the afternoon, we'll hear an economic liberty case, an occupational licensing case, and completely ignore evidence. And instead say, well, then the legislature came up with this, they must have had a good reason for doing so, therefore, we're gonna let it stand. Can Can you, yeah. Something about the law here. Is it on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, you know, state attorney generals are becoming um, more aggressive about using antitrust laws against uh, occupations or licensing. Maybe, maybe it's not enough that people know about it, but um, so in Minnesota, the uh, Democrat ran and his big, one of his big platforms was to use the antitrust state laws against uh, licensing in these groups. Okay, so that's a, a big way to go. Um, and uh, so, th 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 I mean, I think that that's a really exciting thing. Um, so it, now I, I'll say one more thing. Now, uh, so I have a favor for everybody here. Now, I know it's not politically correct to mention religion or politics, but I was wondering if we could all say a prayer that Zephyr teach out wins the New York Attorney General's race today. Who knows Zephyr Teachout? She, if she wins, she's after all the people, you know, that, that she is a very dynamic, she ran against Cuomo last time. She's going, she, she'll be great. Anyway, that's my. Okay, so do you, but do you have a question too or no question? No, no, I have okay. A I have a comment and a favor. Okay, well, then we're going to take another question first. Uh, yes, let's go here. And then I saw some, and then to you, ma'am. So we'll, this question and then, then yours. I'm sorry, I can't see names, so I'm pointing. But, uh, yes. My name is David Benton. I'm from the National Council of State Boards of Nursing. Um, the question, I think, is to, to, to Dick. In your analysis, have you partialed out the mandates of the regulatory entity versus the degree of variation that you see. Um, work that, that I've done internationally um, has demonstrated that those regulators that have a pure single mandate of public protection versus those that have a public protection plus advancing the profession, plus workforce, plus in some cases a trade union mandate as well, uh, that, that actually introduces much more variability and a very different flavor in terms of some of those dimensions that you had. Is that, is that an analysis that you've already conducted? We have not. Others have and have, I think, found something very similar to that. We did not in ours. So our data sources were in particular looking at state statutes or uh, regulatory language. So we didn't actually look into the extra statutory or extra regulatory language to look specifically at that. Others have and have found something similar to what you're describing. Yes, your question back here. Um, yeah, so I guess my question is to all Can the- Can you tell us who you are? Just oh, like sorry, I'm Wen Chen. I'm a PhD student at University of Minnesota with Professor Morris Kleiner. 
Um, so I didn't ask just because of that. <laughs> <laughs> so make it a really pass. good doctoral level question. <laughs> Um, so I guess my question is that uh, it's really clear to me that for occupations like barber and florist, uh, the regulation reform should towards like deregulation because those occupations does not pose a threat, a, like obvious threats to public health and safety to the consumers. But for like childcare, I guess the state's uh, uh, reasoning for a lot of licensing requirements <laughs> is that uh, it protects weak and vulnerable populations like children. And I remember in Professor Dial's uh, presentation, you did find like there are like, uh, for license requirements, there are increased quality for childcare. So I'm just curious, like what do you guys think uh, the regulation reform for this kind of occupation like childcare should go? That one, do you wanna take that question? Sure, so just to review the results, is this on? Yes. Cool. Uh, the results of that study were um, focused on distributional differences so you do see uh, an increase in quality for high-income neighborhoods, um, but we also they also found there was a reduction in providers of child daycare services in low-income neighborhoods. So what you can uh, think of this as, you have providers um, basically no longer serving low-income neighborhoods, and if you're talking about a high-income neighborhood, it's a little hard to disentangle the effect of licensing from catering to a different neighborhood. That said, um, I think what you said um, right before that is a great illustration of the rational basis test. We can all come up with reasons why stuff should be licensed, right? But there's also no reason to think why licensing does that exclusively um, or why it's the best solution. Um, so child, I mean, it's so compelling, right? Children are very vulnerable. Um, but then we also wanna think about not just the potential benefits of a program, Right, but also the costs. So going back to the one of the first slides, right? We're thinking about there's the higher prices for consumers, and then of course the um, net gains that go to the um, licensed providers um, who get the monopoly profits. But we also want to think about the trade-off. Now, and this is like pure economics right here, where it's like I'm saying, would you rather have a lower quality childcare day center versus no daycare center? Obviously we would all prefer to have high quality um, daycare centers, right? But that's not an option for everybody. Um, and the better question, instead of saying license everybody and then make it harder for low income people to um, get childcare when they have to go to work, is to think about other institutional responses we can choose right, to sort of promote, you know, solving these problems. So again, the problem may not even be directly from licensing. It could be from other sources. But I, if anybody else wants to comment on that. Yeah, um, so, you know, I think another area where we've seen that is in healthcare um, with access to care, right? And a lot of times doctors don't want to go to small rural towns to practice because they don't make enough money to repay their loans. And so we thought, well, we'll just offer loan forgiveness and then all these doctors will go into, you know, the country and um, that didn't happen, right? And so now we still have this access to care issue um, with a lot of different aspects of you know, physical care, mental care, all mental health care, all of that. So what we're looking at, uh, you know, as the regulatory response is leveraging telehealth and um, different types of licenses. I know we're gonna talk later about dental hygienists and dentists, which I'm really excited about. Um, but you, know, you leveraging a nurse who is within you know the rural setting, and then connects by telehealth to the neurologist who can provide an effective consultation and therefore provide access to care and do it much more cheaply than we used to be able to do. That requires um, you know some agility within the regulatory sphere, right, to allow for telehealth to to even occur, which brings up all sorts of mobility issues and that type of thing. I do want to report that Colorado's telehealth law, I do think is the most progressive in the nation, but you just saying, whatever, <laughs> just Thank saying, you. just Thank saying, you. very important. But it, it's, it's been exciting to see how the market has responded to that and is already utilizing it. Let's take, oh, we get three questions here. Let's start in the front. Great. I'm Ryan Nunn from uh, the Hamilton Project at the Brookings Institution. And I, I wanted to elaborate on a, on a concern that Corey and Dick talked about um, when they discussed the, the 
short step from some non-licensure forms of regulation to licensure, right? So I think for economists, the difference between voluntary or even state right to title and certification is, is the difference from between that and full-blown licensure is quite large. The difference in terms of political economy, uh, in terms of the, the institution building that, that gets you there is maybe smaller. And I wonder if there's, if that has implications for how we should think about the policy of this. Are there ways to, you know, to, for, for occupations where voluntary certification is the right approach, are there ways to make sure that sticks and that it doesn't become licensure sort of inappropriately? Yes. Um, so we're engaged in a research project. We're right in the middle of it right now, looking at sunrise and sunset laws. And one of the questions we're interested in is, to what extent do sunrise laws do what you're describing? And that is, do they introduce a significant hurdle to the creation of new licenses or, as we're doing in our research, at the elevation from certification, registration, or some other non-licensure option into licensure. So we're particularly interested in that. I would say, I mean, I can't report results right now, but from what we've seen thus far, I would say that can be when it's done and followed in the way that it's intended to, sunrise laws in particular can prevent, uh, present a significant hurdle. It will not eliminate it, but it can present a significant hurdle into the process. In the interest of time, I'm wondering if you raise your hand, if you have like a quick question that you can say succinctly, and we'll take three or four and then cede the rest of the time to our panelists to answer any or all of them. Yes, yours, sir. Jason Faberman from the Chicago Fed. Um, so I'll be, I guess, semi-quick. So my, my big, I guess the big picture question is, I'm kind of wondering why the goalposts are where they are in terms of kind of talking about licensing versus less restrictive regulation. Because like Derek mentioned, a lot of this seems like a lot of rent seeking, particularly on firms that are trying to either outsource training or screening in some way. So why isn't the discussion more on the side of, you know, licensing versus you know, ensuring firm, the onus is on firms to make sure workers are, are trained to a certain degree or that, that, you know, we aren't restricting the bargaining power of the worker using licensing to restrict the bargaining power of workers, so on and so forth. So kind of just wondering why the discussion isn't more on, on, on those terms. Okay, where the goalposts are. Another question. This is the power round, so. No, really? There are hands, yes. Back. Uh, what, are the, uh, what are the issues with respect to the criteria? I know Darwin mentioned uh, health and safety, but it has expanded to financial health and safety. To what extent does financial health and safety uh, correlate with physical health and safety, and where should licensing, what's the boundary there? Okay, and do we have one more to add? Yes. Gotti Barlow, Chicago Fed. So this is uh, seconding kind of Jason's question. It seems like a lot of the issues of public safety are about what people do and what the consequences of their actions are as opposed to who does them. And so the question is, why is the debate about trying to maintain public safety distorted into licensing and who gets to perform the procedures as opposed to what they're allowed to do or consequences of malpractice? Okay, so we have goalposts. We have health, financial health and safety, and we have this question of who and why. Um, so let's start, um, Darwin, with you, and then maybe Dick, and then Corey will give you the last word. Okay, cool. Uh, so addressing the whole question on financial health and safety and public health and safety, um, a lot of the licensing requirements um, will often be correlated with liability coverage requirements. So if you're going to work with pesticide in some states, you need to have liability coverage. Um, but to the degree that that protects the consumer, um, it's not clear. Um, I would love to see more research on this subject. Um, but I think it all comes back to the initial equilibrium, right? Like where we're, if the providers are not worried about the financial health and safety, but rather rent seeking, then this sort of becomes moot. Thanks. Dick? As to goalposts, one, I think, if one looks at how licenses are created, it may answer this question. So there's this myth that legislators create licenses because there is some that the that harmed consumers and concerned citizens are going to the legislature and they're breaking down the doors begging to be protected from all these unlicensed practitioners when in fact when you look at how licenses are created it is members of the industry going to the legislature with a handout asking for a license of their own industry that is how licenses historically overwhelmingly are created 
And so this is the power of the concentrated interests going to the legislature and asking for something to benefit them directly. So it stands to reason when they're going in and asking for something, they're going to go in and ask for a license, a fence, a bottleneck, if you will, to keep competitors out so that they can enjoy an economic benefit as a result. That's how licenses are created. And so the discussion is then driven by these people who are asking for licenses. So do they go in and ask for certification? Yes. Um, and I mentioned that Corey and I both were talking about that. Sometimes they will use a titling law or something else as an entry point and then escalate that into a license. But from our Sunrise research, what we're finding is very often people will start with a request for a license. If they can't get it, then they'll come back. So this is a campaign. So I didn't get my license last year. The next session, now let's go back and ask for a titling law. And then five years later, let's ask for a license after we have the titling law. So it turns into a campaign if they don't get the license the first time. So those who are making the request will often drive the discussion and the content of the discussion. Do you have a comment quickly about um, the financial health, health question that Morris asked? Or are you silent on that one? We'll turn to it, Corey. I want to be silent, but I will say this <laughs> about that. <laughs> Uh, it's not, so what we call, in our report, we call it license creep. So sometimes license creep is an expansion of the licensing requirement. That's a, that's a verb, not a noun, right? License creep. <laughs> yes. I spent too much time with this Morris. Is a face. <laughs> yes. Uh, so sometimes it's the escalation, but also sometimes it's scope of practice. And what we're now finding at IJ, we're also discovering that uh, license creep will also include, I think this is kind of getting at what, what Morris is talking about. He's kind of talking about creep beyond just public health and safety as we typically think of it now to financial safety. But now we also see creep in terms of uh, what is regulated. So now we see s just pure occupational speech is regulated. So people who just speak for a living, they don't provide a service like in healthcare or they don't provide a service like tree trimming. They just speak for a living. That too is now coming under the umbrella of licensing. And, and Corey, over to you. Okay, so on goalposts, um, I, I agree, like we could be shifting to deregulation and, and we should be thinking about that for some professions. Um, uh, and, and yeah, if we can leverage, you know, shifting that burden to firms, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I would be curious to see and I don't know that much research has been done about this, where there is an egregious act by a practitioner is how quickly the market can respond compared to the regulator. And the regulator can come in very quickly, remove that person from practice, even if there isn't enough Yelp reviews to demonstrate that there is danger, right? Um, and so they can come in with just one hint of it. Um, I think that's important that um, the other, um, the, the financial question about financial health and safety. Um, regulation you know, has the benefit of providing some more equal access in some regards where a wealthy consumer typically can um, uh, take action and seek restitution um, by you know, suing someone, hiring a lawyer, all of those things where that poor consumer often cannot do that. Um, and so, so licensing and being able to file a complaint and shift that burden to the regulator um, can help to mitigate some of those issues. Um, and then why is licensing the response to health and safety? I, I do think that's the, the challenge in front of us um, to figure out what is the appropriate regulatory structure um, to, for the actual consumer harm and potential risk. Um, and then we need to craft the regulatory structure to address specifically that, and that means shifting. Great. I'll actually say this about finance, uh, financial risk and so forth. Bernie Madoff was licensed. Well, I guess we'll leave it there. <laughs> I, I, I think we'll be returning to many of these themes in, in panels throughout the rest of the day and tomorrow. But for now, let's thank these panelists. Thank you.